There you go. Okay. Alyssa, thanks. Yes, thank you, Dennis. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sounds like some of you already chimed into a presentation of mine um, not too long ago, about an hour and a half, two hours ago. Uh, my name is Alyssa Johnson, and I am coming to you from the Finger Lakes in New York. Um, I work at the Montezuma Audubon Center for Audubon, New York, and I am an environmental educator. I have been working for Audubon for a little over three years, um, but I've been working in the fields as an intern, as seasonal, longer gigs, and finally Audubon was my first permanent position um, for about 10 years. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about migration, particularly of waterfowl and Montezuma, but I want to introduce you to what Montezuma is before we get started talking about the birds. Montezuma is a really important place. We do lots of fun stuff there. Um, I give paddling tours in the spring, summer, and fall by canoe and kayak. We have boats to rent, just FYI, if you ever wanna come out and go for a paddle. We do snowshoeing in the wintertime, also have snowshoes to rent. Uh, we do a lot of habitat restoration with removing invasive species and planting natives. That's what these kids on the left are doing. There's a native tree sapling in that blue tube. The tube is to protect it from deer and rabbits and squirrels. Do lots of environmental ed programming. Um, before we had to cancel everything due to COVID, we had 16 field trips lined up for the spring. Um, we get homeschool groups, 4-H groups, uh, youth groups, scouts, all sorts of kids groups coming and doing um, fun programming with us. This is my particular favorite, pond exploration. I've saved many a child who's fallen off of that little walkway. The water's only like a foot and a half deep. Um, and we've caught thousands of frogs and crayfish and it's just a lot of fun. I give birding tours uh, frequently. Tomorrow is my last one for the year and I don't have any scheduled yet for 2021, waiting to see what happens with the world, um, but I offer birding tours. And the way we do this now, um, or previously, everyone would ride in the Montezuma van with me. Uh, well, nine people at a time. And then I'd take them around, go to the, I have a whole slew of places I like to visit. Now with COVID, everybody rides in their own vehicle. We dial in to a Zoom phone number, um, just a conference call number, and I, everybody can hear me, and it's great. This picture was taken from the Wildlife Drive at Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. Lots of guided hikes and birding early in the morning, later, even in the middle of the night, uh, we've done uh, night hikes before looking for owls. And then one of our most, um, Probably one of the programs we're proud of most is our youth sportsman uh, program. We offer youth summer camps and three of those we, we offer six weeks. Um, each week is a different theme. The kids can register by week or all of them if they wanted to, but three of those weeks is dedicated to sportsman related education. So trapping, fishing, hunting, firearm safety, all of that. They work with the conservation officers in our area. So they're getting really good experience working with the conservation officers, learning the law, learning how to be a safe and ethical sportsman or woman. And then the culmination of that is in the fall, if they've successfully completed what they need to do, they're invited to come to the Audubon Center. Um, and uh, our building is actually, our, our building in the property we're on is actually owned by the state. I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. But because we're a, a state-owned facility, they release ringneck pheasants on our property, as they do every fall. And um, the kids are offered an opportunity to hunt for pheasant with guides and dogs. It's really cool, very safe. This picture was taken pre-COVID. Otherwise, we would all have masks on. So as you know, you're part of Audubon. We have a national influence. We're coast to coast. We're in all 50 states. We have chapters, we have nature centers and sanctuaries, we have our national and state staff, and of course the lifeblood of any nonprofit are the uh, partners and supporters of um, the organization, National Audubon as a whole, or the state, or uh, a nature center specifically. So we have, um, you can see the tannish color, that shows where the chapters are. So there are some gaps. Um, it goes by, I'm sure you know this, but it goes by zip code. So there are some gaps in there, um, a lot in the Midwest, a lot in the Appalachian Mountains. 
uh, and Ver or um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Like, what's up with that? We need to work on that. Maybe there's a better map out these days. I should I should check. Here's uh, where what our what New York looks like with our chaptership. But I like this map because it shows where we are right here in Western New York. Uh, got a couple other centers around us. This one, Beaver Meadow, is actually um, a chapter center. It's not a state-run center. Same thing with Jamestown um, Audubon Center. The only state facilities we have are Audubon New York sanctioned centers is Montezuma, uh, Ramshorn, Livingston Audubon Center, Buttercup Farm, Rhinestrom Hill, Constitution Marsh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary, and Prescott Park. Um, Kaler's Pond actually, I think, is a chapter as well. So this little red box uh, shows the kind of boundary of the Montezuma Wetlands Complex. So many people hear the word Montezuma and think Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. Down here, this is Cayuga Lake, the very bottom, the northern end of Cayuga Lake. That's one of our largest finger lakes. And from the north end of Cayuga Lake up into uh, Savannah, up north here, um, encompasses about 50,000 acres. And that is what we refer to as the Montezuma Wetlands Complex. We have federal influence down here at the refuge, just where the wildlife drive is. We have a ton of state owned land like Howlands Island. This is just part of it. Um, that's part of the Northern Montezuma Wildlife Management Area. And then of course, <clears throat> excuse me, the Audubon Center, like I said, we are in a state DEC, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC building. We sit on 198 acres. The um, property was sold to the state uh, with hopes that it would turn into a recreational opportunity for people. And so it was a no brainer to build the Audubon Center there. The state though was concerned, the DEC was concerned about staffing it long-term because that's, that's a real cost. So um, Audubon stepped in and we staff it. We do all of the exhibits, all of the programming, but the state owns the building and the property. So all together with the state and the federal um, land that each one is about 10,000 acres. So 20,000 acres. And then, like I said, within the boundary of this wetlands complex map, which I'll go to the next screen, um, this is similar. So here's the north end of Cayuga down here. Here's Audubon Center up here. Here's Howlands Island. Within the boundary of this map, we have 50,000 acres of protected land. Some of that, though, may be public or um, I'm sorry, privately owned land. I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Adirondack State Park in New York. That is six, six million acres. It's the largest state park in the country. And within the boundary of the Adirondacks, there's still private land, municipalities, homes, businesses, whatever, but they are all within the boundary of Adirondack State Park. That is a similar concept here at the Montezuma Wetlands Complex. So we have people all the time that come in to our center and say, oh, it's just at Montezuma. I'm like, well, you still are at Montezuma. <laughs> Did you mean the refuge? People call it a park, people call it a preserve. It's Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. I hope that kind of explains things a little bit. So they're federal, we have the state, there's us. And then I would be remiss if I did not mention our two awesome support groups. We have the Friends of the Montezuma Wetlands Complex, which is another nonprofit completely on their own. They support us, Audubon, um, the refuge and the state, the DEC with monetary support. Uh, they do a lot of fundraising. Sometimes they can help support a restoration project by filling in the last $500 or $3,000 or whatever that needs to be you know, raised to meet the goal for whatever project needs to go on. And then we have MARSH, the Montezuma Alliance for Restoration of Species and Habitats. That is our volunteer group that does so much work around the complex. Um, we do a lot of invasive species removal. We do a lot of plantings. We do surveys for birds. We do surveys for aquatic invasives, um, mapping. Uh, I'm sure there's things that I don't even know about that gets done because volunteers make things happen. So that is in a snapshot what the Montezuma Wetlands Complex is. But I work for Audubon, so I work for a nonprofit. Um, and yeah, that's the story of Montezuma, very brief. Here's our Audubon Center if you've never been. 
Uh, we were the first center in the country to reopen this year. Um, on July 1st, we reopened and um, that was determined because of our infection rate was low and we were very rural. Of course, we have um, guidelines and policies in place, um, but we have been open since July 1st. We have plans of opening again after the holidays. We'll wait and see what happens, but um, this is a view of our property. It looks like probably May or June, probably late May. It's getting leafed out. Everything's so green. Another view of the center. You can see our purple, we have a purple Martin box. Actually, we have two. This is an old picture because there's another one right next to it now. Here's one of our marshes. We have two man-made marshes on the property. So most of the wetlands actually at the Montezuma Wetlands Complex, especially on either the state or the federal land, that is, uh, most of them are man-made. It's a very long story and I don't know if I have time to go through all of it, but um, basically a huge wetland system was created off the north end of Cuyahoga Lake as the glaciers receded about 10 to 15,000 years ago. We were covered in an ice sheet of a mile, mile and a half thick. And um, the, the north end of Cayuga Lake, it was, it's actually believed that it extended much further north, like up into Savannah where I work, uh, than the current lake shore today. And there is a variety of reasons why that's believed. I won't go into it all right now, but the wetlands were, were created. They were known for eons. Uh, by Native Americans, and by the migratory waterfowl and other birds. As the Europeans moved in and started settling, um, started clear cutting, draining, ditching, farming, uh, and really upsetting the natural balance of things. So we, when the land started getting purchased and it's still an ongoing, it's always gonna be ongoing. Uh, so restoration projects were, were done. So here, this, these are pictures from just in November I believe it was this year, it was this fall. I just can't remember how long ago, but within the last month or month and a half, this is another view of the center, but I'm trying to get to the wetland pictures. Here we go. So this is a man-made wetland. Most of the wetlands are man-created. Um, it's because we had construction of the Erie Canal that really sucked a lot of water off the surface by having this big river, river basically system going through the middle of this huge wetlands complex. It just sucked all the water off the surface into the canal and other, other rivers that were incorporated into the canal system. And so just because you put a label on a piece of land and say, all right, you're part of the refuge now, it doesn't just turn into a wetland. Um, wetland is an umbrella term that refers to, well, I'm not gonna get into specific details, but wetland, I mean, I'm sure we could all figure that out. Uh, swamp, marsh, bog, fen, those are all different types of wetlands. So up in the corner here, in the right, this is um, a swamp. Uh, there's some open water, but a lot of dead hard woody vegetation. That's what makes the difference, woody vegetation. And then this is a marsh. So we have a lot of emergent vegetation like um, cattails and phragmites, unfortunately, and rushes and sedges, grasses, things like that. This is a berm that goes all the way around and all of our wetlands have berms to help keep the water where we want. So most people probably have no idea looking at it, um, but they are all pretty much man-made. This is another one. You can really see, so in the spring, this entire, where it's kind of darker color, this is all full of water. This creek, it, this is a berm here where this road is. It's not really a road, but a, a trail access road. This is a berm, so the water can't get over this, but it does flood out to the south here. Um, and this is a, a big floodplain. So we, we can hold a ton of water, but that's the point of a wetland. It's a sponge. So uh, we are, all of us are in the same flyway. We are in the Atlantic flyway. So if you don't know, there are four main flyways across the country from east to west. We have Atlantic, then Mississippi, Central, and Pacific. Uh, of course, there it's not exact. The birds aren't following the exact same route as one another, but with through time and research, we've discovered these general uh, migration routes. Why do birds migrate? Well, a lot of people think it has to do with temperature. 
And that is kind of a factor, but if it was just temperature, we wouldn't have birds here in the winter time, right? But if you have a bird feeder, you know that you do because you have chickadees and cardinals and titmice and tree sparrows and juncos and whatever. You have tons of birds on your feeder. And of course you see other birds around. Birds are leaving to go from an area of a low or decreasing resource to an area of high or increasing resource. A lot of time that is food. Warblers, for example, they are insect eaters, right? And they could not they could not survive here into the late fall and winter. Although on our Christmas bird count Monday, um, one yellow warbler and two yellow rumped warblers were detected. So that's pretty cool. And actually last year I got a yellow, I got a yellow rumped warbler on our CBC. So we always know there's outliers and vagrants, but for the most part warblers leave us because there's no insects and they are not adapted to the cold. So they gotta go. food and then breeding. So um, it's really amazing to me that we have, I know that you're here for waterfowl, but one more thing about warblers, it's amazing to me that so many of them spend, they overwinter in South and Central America, Mexico, Caribbean, and they come here to the Northeast and beyond up into Canada to breed. Why? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there are theories out there, but it just, one of those things that just blows my mind that this tiny little bird makes it so, so far to be here for six to eight weeks and turn around and leave again. So I'm just gonna go through all the different ducks. I hopefully I'm not missing any species uh, that you can see um, at the complex at different times of year. So right now we have no wood ducks. They are one of those species that leaves us and heads south. So we don't have any wood ducks and I'm, I haven't seen the entire um, data sheet yet for the uh, Christmas bird count. So I don't know if anybody got one at all, but we didn't see any. American widgeons. So um, at this time, we are past our peak duck migration. Uh, we have a lot of divers. A lot of the dabblers have moved out, but a lot of diving ducks. So dabblers and divers um, is kind of a way we group ducks. The dabbling ducks like this, these widgeon, they are in shallow water, not very deep, and you will see them tip up. I'm sure you've seen mallards and Canada geese do this. If Canada geese were a duck, they'd be a, a dabbler too. They tip up and they're feeding in short and shallow water so they can get to vegetation and maybe some macroinvertebrates and tubers and roots or whatever. So they're tipping up and feeding right in shallow water. Here's some, and I'll get to the divers in a moment. Here's some more. One of my favorites, the Northern Pintail. It looks like uh, he may have lost his pintail, but they usually have this. Well, maybe he's coming out of his breeding plumage. A couple of very, very long skinny feathers that give them their name. Here are some divers. So the divers, as their name implies, are ducks that dive. They're eating things, they're eating more protein, animal protein. So fish, crayfish, I saw a ringneck duck eating zebra mussels off of a dock like piling, uh, which is great because zebra mussels are a huge issue for us in the Finger Lakes. They're invasive. Uh, and they're, so they're the divers. Um, so dabblers and divers just to kind of give, or puddle duck is another name for dabblers. Um, I kind of remember that they can feed in a puddle. It's so small, but a redhead and the other divers could not because it's too shallow. Another dabbler, one of my, I'm going to say this a hundred times, another one of my favorites, northern shovelers. They are so cool looking. So the male and the female, um, a very different plumage. At this time of year, the males are looking much drabber. See, I wish I could include pictures of all the different phases of the plumage. We'd be here till 11 o'clock tonight. And um, so I'm just, I kind of just chose some pictures that I really like, but um, this is them and they're in the males and his brilliant breeding plumage. I've heard several nicknames for these guys. I worked in Alabama for a winter running a waterfowl hunt on a national wildlife refuge, Eufaula National Wildlife Refuge. And I don't make generalizations about people from Alabama, but they do not know their duck names. <laughs> the names I heard for the shoveler include Smiling Mallard, Spoonbill, or Spoonie, uh, which just cracks me up. Northern Shoveler, they are a puddle duck or a dabbler. 
they uh, have this amazing flared bill. They do a lot of sieving around in the, in the very shallow water for those little macroinvertebrates, uh, worms, leeches, uh, little insects, snails maybe, things like that. Uh, but they'll also eat vegetation. A couple of our divers, hooded mergansers. So mergansers are really cool beca <clears throat> because they're the closest to a bird, as close as a bird is going to get to having teeth, I think. So birds don't have teeth, um, but these guys do have some ridges along the edge of their bill. It's kind of like a steak knife uh, and the, <clears throat> the, the points point backwards. And that's because they're going to grab slimy, slippery things like fish or crayfish, and they don't want to let it slip away from them. So they have these little ridges. I'm sure if you ran your finger over it, it might prick a little bit. It's not going to cut you, uh, but it'll help hold on to those slippy, slippery and slimy food items or diving for. Gadwall. I feel like this is such an underappreciated uh, species of duck. This is a dabbling duck. Uh, when they're um, resting or they have their, they've landed and they're got their wings folded. They are pretty uniform all over looking kind of drab, but this little rusty and black and white patch is just so pretty when they uh, show those wings. Blue winged teal. So these guys moved out a while ago. Um, we ha I haven't seen any of them in a while. They're very small. We have two species of teal here in the Northeast, blue winged and green winged. I'll get to the green wing soon. Um, but the, the, just to give you an idea of the size, if you've never, I, I feel like you really truly can't appreciate the size of birds in general, unless you're holding them in your hand, um, which I realize not everybody can do or should do. But when I was working in Alabama, I had to collect the data off of all of the birds that were being harvested during that hunt. So I handled a lot of birds. And just to give you a, some, a size in your head, so I'm sure you all know what a, a chicken breast looks like when you go to the grocery store and buy it. It's big, it's unnatural. A uh, wild chicken would not, jungle fowl, uh, they come from India. Uh, they, would, they don't have breast meat like that. Um, and so the next uh, would be a mallard. This is kind of the steps I go, a mallard. The breast meat for a mallard is about the size of your palm. And they're a pretty big duck. They're, they're considered a big duck. And then the teal. Their breast meat, if you are good at breasting out duck, which is difficult, uh, is about the size of like a healthy chicken nugget. Just to give you some idea of size, they're, they're very small. The male is in the back with that uh, beautiful white crescent around his face. And of course you can't see these pictures, but they do have blue on their wings. More divers, common mergansers, more fish eaters. You can see the little hook, the little tip on the tip of the beak here. Uh, to help them grab their uh, prey. I'm gonna look at, oh, okay. I was, I just, I saw the chat box flashing. Sharon says, thank you for including both, both uh, male and female of the species. Yes, well, it's important because so many people know what, if I say I'm mallard, maybe not to this group because you're birders, but if I say I'm mallard to, to general people, they will think greenhead. And actually my best friend from childhood has thought this entire time of her life until very recently when I corrected her that mallard meant a boy duck. And was, mind was blown when I corrected her. <laughs> Come on, let's go to the next one. Okay, ruddy duck, what a handsome little duck. These guys are still not the smallest. They are very small though. Uh, this guy is in his full breeding plumage. And um, I wanted to, I, I, I had pictures. So non-breeding plumage and females look very similar. They're very drab. They kind of have a line through the eye. I wanted to show this picture though, because they are, I just think they're the weirdest looking duck. They kind of have a flared bell. I actually, when I was in Alabama, somebody harvested one of these and brought it to me and said, here, I have a baby spoonie for you. Uh, it was like, let me, where do I even start unpacking this? First of all, <laughs> it's not a spoonie. That's not that there's a roseate spoon bill and it's not a duck and it's not a Northern shoveler, which is what you meant. It's a ruddy duck. And the guy was like, I've never heard of that. We had a conversation about knowing what you're shooting at. 
after. But anyway, uh, they do have a flared beak. It's not as long or large. And then the other big uh, character or ID mark, I guess, is this very stiff tail. It sticks up like that a lot. Kind of almost reminds me of a wren, the way they hold their tail. Uh, and ruddy ducks are divers. They, we just had a bunch of them come through. Actually, I think someone on the, someone on the CBC got, I can't remember if it was at the, so the wildlife drive at the refuge is closed now. It closes December 1st through April 1st. But for the CBC, a team was given permission to go in to the drive. And I can't remember if it was there or at the, down on Cuga Lake, but they counted 96 ruddy ducks. That's cool. Uh, when I was giving tours in the refuge still before uh, the drive closed down, you know, I'd point like, okay, there's a ruddy duck. It's on your left. It's next to the blah, 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 whatever. And as soon as I feel like I was explaining where to look, gone, dive, and then pop up 20 feet away. So I would just say to people, look to your left, keep your eyes on the waters. And if something pops up, it's probably a ruddy duck. And, and that's how we got through that. But they are fast. They have charisma. They're just super cute. Here's the mallard, you know, she just eat my own words. The mallard, beautiful, um, like all American duck. Everybody knows what this is. Um, they've been domesticated as well. So sometimes you see some really bizarre plumage uh, and that's because the wild ones um, may have interbred with the domesticated mallard. But this is a nice healthy male with a green head, yellow bill, orange feet, the blue speculum, with the two white stripes and uh, that collar as well. Another uh, diver, the buffle head. So this picture is great because it shows how iridescent this head really is. Most of the time it will look like flat black, but in the right light, man, look at that. It's like a starling almost of that beautiful iridescence. Here are green winged teals. So I'm pretty sure that the green winged teal is the smallest duck, at least in North America. It's it's a pretty small duck. I could hold it easily in one hand with like wings, you know, closed in one hand and couldn't get away. They're very cute. Um, and they look so different from the blue winged teals with their coloration and their plumage. The males look so, so different. Uh, but really gorgeous with this coppery coloration and then the green. Um, and then they both have the green speculum, that spot on the wing, like the mallard with the blue was, they both have that spot, giving them their name. American black duck, often confused for mallards because they do look very similar, but there are some differences uh, on the wing where the blue patch, the speculum is, they don't have white outlines. It's um, like black outlines on either side. Uh, the color of the bill, uh, eye line, the, over their, the overall general appearance of the duck. They often look very dark when you're looking at them from a distance. So I think that's where they got, the, they were named in the, some birds were named in the hand and some birds were named in the field. This is one that I think was named in the field from a distance because obviously we're looking at it up close and it's not black, but it got that name. And actually let me go back really quick. Um, Pretend you didn't see that. The, we um, are part of a flyway wide. So along the East Coast, the Atlantic Flyway, uh, part, I forget what it is, North American Waterfowl something. It's a, it's a research, research group and the state and the federal, the refuge are in on it. And in the winter time, like January, February and into the beginning of March, really depends on the weather. Uh, they do a trapping effort to trap, trying to trap for American black duck, but also get mallard. The mallards breed with everybody, everybody that they can breed with. I've seen a pintail north or a pintail mallard hybrid, pintail gadwall, pintail wit or sorry, mallard gadwall, mallard widgeon, mallard black duck. That's the big one, and they're diluting the black duck population. So from what I understand, black Black ducks were the East Coast bird and um, they were more in wooded areas. I mean, 99% of the Northeast was wooded um, before, you know, started clearing land for different reasons. 
once we started clearing land and opening up the land and doing a lot more agriculture and a lot more um, animal farming, the mallards, which were more of a prairie duck, started moving in because we changed the habitat and are now interbreeding and pushing out the American black duck. They're not considered invasive, the mallards, because they existed on this continent on their own and they got here on their own. Um, but it's just very interesting research and I'm always uh, happy to tag along and go duck banding with them. Even though it's on the side of the lakeshore of Cuga Lake in the bitter cold, it's still fun. The scop, we have lesser and greater that come through, another diver. We have tons of these right now. Um, there are a couple spots that you can see them. Uh, even though you can't go onto the wildlife drive at the refuge, you can still visit the visitor center. Uh, the, the refuge, Montezuma National Wildlife, Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge Visitor Center, and they have a beautiful observation deck, and then they have a second story one. If you go up to the second story, you can see out into the marsh, and you can see, I mean, it's hard to see individuals, thousands of diving ducks, hundreds of swans. We've had sandhill cranes hanging out out there, Canada geese, eagles on muskrat huts. It's, it's a busy place. And then also, if you go down to Cayuga Lake, anywhere there's big open water, uh, you will find these guys. So lesser scop. Um, got this little notch in the back of the head. Also, I can't remember if I have a greater scop slide. I feel like I don't. The, this is iridescent kind of purpley blue and the greater uh, scop is iridescent greenish. Will look black, but has a slight shine of green. Canvas backs, another duck with a red head. So we have redheads, not redheaded duck, Redhead, that is their name. If you open up a bird book, that's what you can find, redhead. And then the canvas back, and there's a couple scop in there as well. Uh, canvas backs are divers as well. They have a really interesting shaped head. Uh, they have a, a very straight, uh, like the bridge of their nose kind of. And they got their name because they're very white and they look like they're wrapped in canvas. This is a common view at Montezuma. Lots of ducks. Actually, this picture is pretty cool because we got a coyote back here stirring things up. But I see uh, pintail, wigeon, mallard. There's probably more that I'm just not picking out, but got at least three species uh, of duck, and then we got a coyote. Another crazy picture. I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of seeing the sky look like this with any bird, but waterfowl in this case, it's mesmerizing. I'm gonna share some a video with you um, at the end. We've got our Canada geese, of course. Um, many people are tired of Canada geese. Uh, back when the Refuge and the, the state DEC um, wildlife management area were being established in the 30s. Uh, they were actually creating wetlands with Canada geese in mind and providing nesting habitat for them. So they really like to nest on hummocks, uh, muskrat huts, for example, but a hummock of vegetation or whatever in the open water, not, you know, it's sticking up out of the water. So when they're digging these wetlands and restoring the land, they would put these little hummocks in and around the wetlands. And now you gotta laugh because we have in New York, we have a hunting season that uh, the early goose season, it starts September 1st to target the resident goose species only because migration hasn't begun yet. And to try to knock down their numbers a little bit because they are considered a nuisance species by some people, like a mess of parks, golf courses, beaches, they can be aggressive. <laughs> um, oh, here, but this is a great picture of a, a tip up. So the, the butts up in the air as the birds are um, foraging for whatever is under there. Um, but we have lots of Canada geese here right now, which is really cool. I love seeing them in the sky. We've got swans. So uh, we have trumpeter swans and tundra swans. I, on the Christmas bird count, somebody reported one mute swan. That is the first time I've ever heard 
excuse me, heard of one in the complex. Uh, so we really don't have an issue with mute swans. That's the invasive species. So we actually have trumpeter swans, a handful that breed in our, in the complex, in the Montezuma Mountains complex. Um, historically, trumpeters did not breed in this part of the country, but they do now. And then we also get tundras. So trumpeter swans lacking, the, the, the tundra swan will have a little yellow spot right here sometimes, not all the time, because of course that would be too easy. But trumpeter swans will never have a yellow spot. It's called the lore, like the corner of their eye. Also the shape of their head, kind of like a canvas back, very straight down the off the forehead, very straight. These guys are also huge. I believe they're the heaviest flying bird in uh, North America. They are much bigger than tundra swans, but sometimes, and, and for me, for sure, it's difficult to tell the difference when you're looking, looking at a distance. Um, and then we got some other mixed waterfowl in here. There's a Canada goose hiding, some mallards, black ducks. Let me see if I can pick out a black duck. I mean, these guys look like black ducks. I was hoping we'd get a better picture of one rather than just heads. Uh, this looks like a black duck here too. Uh, I wanna share a cool story I had. So I took this picture and I'm actually, I'm gonna go back really quick. So that tag says K08. And this picture, which is in our Audubon database of photos, here's another one yellow tags with the same number. So I don't know where in the country this picture was taken, but this bird and the bird I saw were banded uh, by the same people probably at the same time because that one was an eight and this is a 15, really close in number if they're going in order, which is kind of cool. But I wanted to share this. So I was out on a tour with people and I saw, I'd never seen a wing tag like this. So they have a wing, it's a tag on each wing and it's a great, um, so a lot of times we use bands, which is just a little aluminum band that goes around the leg, but you, it's, it, you, sometimes you can see the band, but getting the numbers off of it, usually the only way you do that with waterfowl is if it's been harvested and you're holding a dead bird in your hand, you can read the numbers. Um, but on other species, bigger species, uh, they use things like this. So you can go to, I forget what the website is, but you can Google like reporting bird banding or bird tags or whatever, and you'll you'll get you'll be brought to the website. It's run by the USGS, which is the US Geological Survey. And so I input the information they asked for, and a couple of weeks later, I got this. I got the certificate sent to me. Uh, and I learned about this bird. So she was banded in 2013. I took this picture in. I think 2018. She was hatched in 2010 or earlier. You can tell ages, um, different feathers, uh, conditions of feathers, numbers of feathers, things like that, uh, that you can figure out age. And then this is where we were in Union Springs, which is down the east side of Cayuga Lake. There's a little uh, spring fed pond there. So in the wintertime, it's hopping. It's a place to go find waterfowl. Oh yeah, here, encountered 2018. I was right. Um, and this is just really cool because here's the bander and this was in Burlington, Ontario. So not super far from where I am, but just really, really cool. So if you ever get a chance to report a bird band or tag, do it because it's super interesting. And then I shared the story on multiple birding Facebook groups because I, I think it's super cool and I wanted to encourage people to do it too. And through the power of Facebook, I was actually connected not with Ray, but someone working under, under his permit. Her name is Laurel and she actually knows, knew this bird and was asking about this bird because he did not have, I'm assuming he, because they're paired up, did not have tags on him. And she was known to be with a tagged male. So something happened to that male and she found herself a new boyfriend. So uh, a couple questions. What's the most plentiful waterfall at the, the, I'm assuming you mean in like the wetlands complex right now, diving ducks, uh, well, diving ducks. We have, we believe over 250 sandhill cranes as well right now they may move out with the storm going on but that's that's about it um uh howard tags attached to the wing doesn't affect its flight it does not affect its flight 
Um, I think it, it must go through tissue because the, they molt their feathers. And if they, it was through just feathers, it would fall out. Um, I know that sounds maybe a little gruesome, but it's similar when we tag the ear of a bear. It's a superficial injury that heals pretty quickly to learn more. And the last question I'll take right now is what is the best time of year to visit the complex? That is up to you and what kind of birder you are. So, you know, if you want to see the neotropical migrants like the warblers, the thrushes, the tanagers, orioles, gross beaks, things like that, come in May and June. But if you want to see hundreds of thousands of waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans, the best time is in late February, March timeframe. If you wanna see shorebirds, late summer, there's always something going on. If you don't like the cold, don't like the wind, don't like the humidity, don't like the bugs, whatever. Don't like the sunlight, go out looking for owls. It really depends on what you are interested in. And I give tours, I've been doing about two tours a week all fall and it's never boring for me. I, I always see something new. Okay, we'll move on. And I also saw someone posted the link to, um, to report this kind of thing in the chat. So check that out. Thank you for doing that. Here are our tundra swans. Okay, so you can see this little yellow spot. Uh, and I think this one is a little bit of a yellow spot, but this looks like a trumpeter to me. So much straighter off the forehead, missing that yellow spot. And then size is so difficult, we can't tell because they're at all different distances from the photographer. The dirty looking ones are juveniles, this grayish color, but this rusty coloring on the plumage here, that's interesting. Uh, we see that on sandhill cranes too. Uh, wherever these birds are must be in a very uh, like um, iron rich environment or um, not nutrient, What's the word I'm looking for? Whatever, I'm sure you know what I mean. Uh, there's a lot of blank in the soil where they're feeding and they're preening and iron is one of those things. And um, as they're preening and feeding, it gets on their feathers and it oxidizes, it rusts and turns into this orangey color. Minerals, thank you. Who just said that to me? Leslie, thanks Leslie. Yes, minerals <laughs> in the soil. Um, and so it's cool because with sandhill cranes, we, uh, we have them breeding here in the complex. And um, when migration starts and we start getting more coming through the area, we can tell who the locals are because they kind of have this rusty tinge to them. And the non-locals that are coming from elsewhere are that steely gray color. Just fun little piece of information. more trumpeter swans, got two adults going at it and two young ones going at it. So look at how ragged these feathers are. So these look like, they're, these are the secondaries, uh, flight feathers that are coming in. Look how long and even these are on this other bird. So they're molting, they're getting their adult plumage, raggedy, raggedy feathers. Birds have to molt because it's like if you wore the same outfit every single day, outdoors while you're migrating. Your clothes would become dirty, disgusting, haggard. And so they molt to make sure that they stay dry and clean and they can fly um, because this is probably not that conducive to uh, distance flying at least. This was from November. This is what it looks like along the wildlife drive. Uh, so these little black dots out here are hundreds and thousands of Mostly redhead, scop, canvas back, uh, ringnecks. And then at this time, we still had a bunch of the puddle or the dabblers like widgeon, pintail shoveler, the teals, ruddy mallards. Um, so, there, and there are some coot and gallinule mixed in here too, I think. But uh, this is what it looks like when we, when migration is ramping up. picture I took last winter out on Cayuga Lake. So these are all ducks. And this picture went on, I mean, I could probably do four more frames on either side of this one of how many birds there were. And this is, if you don't know, what we refer to as a raft 
of birds. So it's a mixed flock of all different diving ducks. And uh, there's some swans hanging out here. There might be some Canada geese mixed in there as well. Um, maybe snow geese, but this is what it looks like in the winter time when you're, when you're looking for waterfall. Got to have good optics because, I mean, you're never going to, you, you're going to see a blob out there, but not individuals. So everybody's most favorite waterfall species that I, that they come looking for. The fall migration for snow geese, uh, they seem to go through New England more than come through New York in the fall. I've been seeing myself and then reports of small flocks. So maybe, I know this sounds ridiculous, maybe three or 5,000 at a time um, or a couple hundred um, or smaller than that. Uh, but in the springtime, it starts looking like this in the sky. Snow geese are white with a black wing tip. Uh, I think I have a better picture. Yep, yeah, right here. So we also have this color. This is not a female or a juvenile. I mean, it could be, but it's it's not like all females are this dark color. So this is what we call blue goose. It is about, uh, I believe, one percent of the population of snow geese. Uh, it's just a different color, just a different color, a different uh, pigmentation. It's kind of a grayish color. People call them a blue goose, a blue snow goose. They're the same species, just um, got this different coloration going on. And it might be hard to tell, but I can see this snow goose looks kind of rusty like he's been feeding in a field with um, a lot of minerals <laughs> in the soil. Okay, oh, Rich Col Colette, I think uh, lots of great wineries up that way too. Yeah, we got birds and wine, so come visit, okay? <laughs> and actually, um, pre-COVID, we often did programming with wineries and we actually did one twice a year at a winery, which was really fun. So you got birds, um, and, and an outdoor activity that was either snowshoeing or paddling, depending on the season, and then a wine and food pairing. We'll get back to it as soon as we can, but we try to capitalize on what people love about the Finger Lakes, and that's the wildlife and the wine industry, among other things, but those are two big ones. I mean, it just looks like a snowstorm, and what's so cool about them, because they have the black wingtips, when they fly, it looks like glitter to me. The flashing of the black and the white. There's a couple I see up here. Here's a blue goose. Here's a couple. So probably about 1% if you did the, did the math. Here they are landing in a cornfield. People ask us all the time, where's the best place to go see whatever, sandhill cranes, eagles, snow geese, whatever. The problem with the Montezuma wetlands complex is that we have a ton of great habitat. So there are some places that some birds, some bird species tend to hang out more. Um, but this is a random agricultural field that I drove by on my way to work and came across these geese landing. We have a lot of soybeans and a lot of corn grown in our area. And it's amazing how much is wasted when they harvest and the birds are here for it. They love to eat that uh, spilled soybean and corn. It's great carbs and protein to help fuel them for migration. I also took this picture. This again is a fragment of the flock. So I said three or three to 5,000 is a small number because we get into the hundreds of things. I mean, look at this down here. I, it, it's mind blowing. It's overwhelming. If you ever see this in person, which I hope you all make a road trip and come see um, either on your own, or I'd be happy to plan a tour with you, with your group. But I hope that you get to see this at some point, whether it's in New York or elsewhere, it's just one of the most amazing things to see. So uh, juvies, juveniles here. Not quite, so here's a blue goose in the back. Got that real distinct, like, uh, they're not, 
I don't think they're all completely colored in. They seem to have this white head and the, the body is darker, but these are some juvenile birds mixed in here. Let me see a couple more chats I'll pop in. Uh, <laughs> my owner home wants to know if there are any winter campgrounds open. I honestly don't know. Um, we have, there's a great campground. It's not open right now. That's open. It's a privately owned campground. It's right in the middle of the complex. Remember I said there's private land in within the complex boundaries it is right in the middle of the complex and um, new owners this past year, they reached out to us and said, how can we partner with you guys? And uh, they've been letting me use their boat launch to get into a part of the canal and um, a river. Uh, that I can't get to with look boat launch there, but they've been letting me do that. Um, and I've been directing people to go camp there. So Rivers Crossing Campground in Marina, look them up. Um, and then there's also Cayuga Lake State Park, which is near uh, south of us, but not far. Um, and, but I don't know if they're open year round, I'm not sure. And with these COVID times, I don't know. Come on, let's. Okay, so this is one of the last things I'm gonna show you. So turn on your volume. I hope it's loud enough for you to hear it. I took this, this is a video, took this in March, 2020, right before everything hit the fan. Uh, they showed up this year around the first week of March. So we never know. It's usually sometimes, I've seen them show up the last week in February. I've also seen them show up the third week of March. So it really depends on the weather. If they, if there's no ice up here and it's melting and it's getting milder and they can feed, then they'll start moving up north, but they'll linger if it's a colder, harder, snowier winter. So let me play this for you. Did you share the sound when you uh, shared your screen? Um, because I, I don't I'm not, know. I'm not hearing anything. Shoot! Why? Mm, oh, share computer sound. Start over. Can you hear it? They just keep coming and coming and coming. I'm watching this like this is the first time I've ever seen it. <laughs> Truly one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. This particular instance, I left work at the end of the day. So I leave about 4.30. This was in March. So I don't know what the sunset is, but um, it takes me about 10 minutes, maybe, maybe seven or eight minutes to get to this spot. It's just south of um, our Audubon Center. And if anyone is familiar with the Montezuma area, this is the 31 Muck Flats. Route 31 goes, I'm standing, I'm on the side of Route 31, which is um, a very busy road. Um, and these are muck flats. So muck is the rich soil that um, is created from a wetland, Dye, dead organic material, plant matter, basically over eons. And it's rich and its nickname is black bold. It's very dark in color. There's no rocks in it. And it's great for growing root crops like potatoes and onions, which is really what put Savannah on the map. In this area right now, they're doing a lot of soybeans and corn. Um, and in the winter time, 
this we we believe this whole expansive area was actually a wet would be a wetland if it was allowed to exist naturally um but in the winter time it's still floods so you can see a lot of ice and water here and i showed up here after work i was the only one even though it was you know when this when we're expecting this to happen birders are moving around a lot like looking for them out scouting for them i found them i was the only one there i have another video of this same moment that I don't share with the public who's laughing like a lunatic and swearing a lot because I'm sure you can imagine the words I was saying when I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? It's just, you see what I mean by glitter? It almost looks like on the old TVs when um, like the the network would go down for the night and it was like that, that static or the snowstorm kind of fitting since there's no geese, but they do this super cool thing where they spiral, they vortex. So it's hard to see, and I'm like, my, I'm all over the place um, recording them, but, and I'm low on the ground, but there's another spot in the complex, not far from this spot. They are up high um, on a hill, looking down into a wetland. And so they will all come in from every direction, streaming in and they're landing and they're landing just like this. This video was taken right after something happened. I don't know if it was an eagle or a falcon or a fox, or one goose looked at another goose and said, I don't like you and thus started whatever. And they all picked up and they get going. This was easily, and I'm very conservative with my counts because I'm always afraid someone's gonna be like, are you, you don't know what you're doing. 300,000 is what I'm saying. But I've also heard reputable people who work in the complex say 500,000, half a million birds, uh, snow geese. So, so they go up in the air and they're acting crazy. They're flying around, they're honking. They go like half a mile up in the sky and then they start to spiral and they start to come down. And when you're in this other spot I was describing up on a hill, it's cool because you're looking into the flock as they're spiraling. So you start seeing birds go in two different directions as they're landing and then everybody will settle down and everything will get quiet. And then they're up again. And usually if you see any kind of waterfowl freaks out like that, look around for a bald eagle or um, a peregrine falcon. Those are two of the big ones that will get everybody going because falcons, their nickname is a duck hawk. They will absolutely catch, I don't know about a snow goose, might be a little big for them, but ducks for sure. So that is my video. I have one more just to end the presentation, not snow geese, but oops, a cool video. Um, this is me. This was taken last summer during one of our summer camps, and we were duck banding wood ducks with the um, with the refuge staff. So just a fun little video. She was banded and released. This is a wood duck, and this is one of our most favorite places to go birding. This is called the Sand Hill Crane Unit. Kind of gives you an idea of what Montezuma looks like in the summer. So I think that about wraps up my information I'm going to be giving you, but let me hop to the chat real quick. Um, see if I missed anything. Uh, I am fine if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions that way, or you can do it in the yeah. chat. Please, please unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one. Yeah, happy to answer questions. And you can take yourself off video too, if you'd like. But feel free to email me. Um, you can do that. We also are on social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram. And uh, you can keep up with us that way. We try really hard to keep our social media, especially Facebook updated with what we're seeing, what's going on, because people kind of look to us for some help in finding birds. Hi, hey, Alyssa, this is Leslie. When is a good, a good time to see the Sandhill Cranes? I always try to get out to, um, like out to uh, Nebraska and that's a haul in really bad yeah. weather. So I didn't know there were some much closer. Yeah, so we actually had our highest count um, at once just a couple of weeks ago, it was 256. We're trying to figure out how many we can record for Christmas bird count because we had multiple people 
reporting large groups and it would have put us at like over 500 cranes and we're pretty sure we don't have that many. So we're trying to figure out timing. But in November seems like a great time. 20 years ago, we didn't have any breeding. We didn't, we had a very few migrating through the area. So fast forward 20 years, we probably have five to 10 breeding pairs, probably a couple dozen that hang around through the growing season. Um, and you can find them, but they're more paired off for like a smaller group of maybe six or five, you know. In the fall though, in October and November is when they start ramping up. And last year's highest number that I counted was 176. So we blew it out of the water this year with 256. So yeah, late fall is a good time. Uh, and like I said, if anyone wants to come visit, I'd be happy to put together a group program for you guys. Uh, if you wanna come as a group or you're coming on your own, uh, keep an eye on our website. I should have included that. I'll do that right now, I'll put it in the chat. Um, that's where we keep our program registration, a program calendar. Um, it's just montezuma.audubon.org. And then look for like programs and events or something like that. Um, but you could come on one of our tours or just stop in and say hi and ask where's what and we'll send you on your way. So that's all I have for you tonight. Any other questions? End it on time, kind of. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Okay, so uh, we'll be off for uh, uh, for a few weeks, and then uh, in January, on January twelfth, Amy Hopkins is going to be uh, uh, telling us about a trip that she took to Australia to see parrots. And then at the in the end of um, January, on January 20, 27th. 20, yeah, I think it's the 27th. Yeah. And, Gina yeah. Will, be, will be rejoining us. So Gina, give us a preview a little bit. Yeah, th thank you. Um, some of you were watching the talk I gave on Borneo last week, but um, I got in touch with Dennis and said, uh, this group might like my owl program. It's called Looking for Owls because I focus on owls of Southern New England and the experiences I've had locally in the past year uh, and previous to that, finding owls. So hopefully that's of interest. I know everybody loves owls and um, that's what I'll be talking about, how to look for and find owls. So that's on the 27th and the uh, programs are listed on the website with uh, links to our the registration. So uh, go there, register, and uh, we'll see you next month. Meanwhile, have a safe and happy holiday season and uh, happy and hopefully better new year than this year has been. Thank so. you, everyone. Have a great evening.